Pac-Man. How could you? Every single person on this worthless planet knows Pac-Man. It's one of the most famous video games of all time. My mom knows how to play Pac-Man, and she's pushing 60. It's been ported to every conceivable platform you can imagine, and as a result, anyone who is even passingly familiar with the medium of video games knows these characters. You got Pac-Man, and, 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 and the blue one, the red one, the pink one, and Clyde. Everybody knows Clyde. Obviously, I'm leaving one out. Despite not appearing in the original arcade game, Miss Pac-Man is still widely known by many, probably more so than those rhyming ghosts. After her arcade game came out in the early 80s, she quickly became an integral part of the franchise, appearing alongside her husband in numerous games that far fewer people give a shit about. Despite her status as an icon and a mainstay of the franchise for two decades, Bandai Namco seemed to stop using the character overnight in the late 2000s and me being me, I find that really interesting. Let's talk about it. Now, the original Pac-Man arcade game was released in Japan by Namco in 1980, but when it came time to give the game a US release, they licensed it out to Midway instead. Fast forward to 1981. This company called General Computer Corporation, or GCC for short, is developing mod kits for existing arcade machines. Think of what they did as kind of like an 80s equivalent to ROM hacking. They'd often change the layouts and graphics of these arcade games to make new versions, which they would then sell to arcades to be installed onto the existing cabinets. One such enhancement kit, Super Missile Attack, a modification of Missile Command, got them sued by Atari, and under a sealed settlement, GCC would no longer be allowed to sell these conversion kits without consent from the developers of the original games. This was bad news for the Pac-Man conversion they'd been working on, called Crazy Auto. Crazy Auto featured new levels, modified enemy AI, and, most obviously, new characters. With legs horrifying legs. But because of this lawsuit, if Crazy Auto was ever going to see a release, GCC was going to have to go through Midway. At the time, Pac-Man was still making a killing in American arcades, but Midway was growing impatient. They were tired of waiting for Namco to make a follow-up. So when GCC presented Crazy Auto to them, they were thrilled. They bought the rights for it, and the three companies, GCC, Midway, and Namco, worked together to get the game ready for release. Crazy Auto became Super Pac-Man. Probably would have been awkward to keep that title considering that Namco's first Pac-Man sequel would be going by the same name, so then it became Pac-Woman, then Miss Pac-Man. But wait, the, the stork takes the fucking baby to Pac-Man and Lady Pac-Man in the third intermission. What are they? Are, are they fucking? Are they dating? Are they married? Are they having an affair? Gamers are too stupid to put the pieces together themselves. We need some goddamn clarification. We're gonna call her Mrs. Pac-Man. No, Steve, Mrs. Pac-Man sounds fucking stupid. We're gonna change it back to Miss Pac-Man, but this time it's an abbreviation, not the full written out word. Ronald Reagan is the president. Trickle down economics aren't fucking working. I hate my life. And so, after going from Crazy Otto to Miss Pac-Man in the span of only two weeks, with the last name changes between Miss, Mrs., and Miss occurring within 72 hours of one another, the game was finally released in February of 1982. Probably. Arcade release dates are kind of hard to get down to an exact science, but you know, we're just estimating given given some of the records there. Look, I'm just trying to do my job. And it quickly became almost as popular as the original Pac-Man, often being considered the superior game by dedicated players. Apparently, it was particularly popular with women, which makes sense as the original game was specifically designed to be appealing to both men and women at a time when arcades tended to be male dominated. Anyways, given that the game was created primarily by GCC under the watchful eye of Midway, while Namco was the original company that created Pac-Man, you can imagine that the copyright for Miss Pac-Man got particularly messy. According to the killer list of video games, which sounds like the most reliable source, Midway eventually turned the rights for the game over to Namco. But of course, while Namco went on to own the game itself, they weren't the ones who created it. According to a former GCC designer, Steve Golson, there were numerous lawsuits regarding the game in 1983. The one of note here is 
is the one in which GCC settled with Namco. Ms. Pac-Man arcade machines were no longer being manufactured by this point, but an agreement was reached. If Namco ever made any more Ms. Pac-Man machines, they were to give a certain amount of royalties to GCC. Keep that in mind. Ms. Pac-Man went on to become a staple character in future Pac-Man titles across various iterations, first making return appearances in the Midway produced titles Junior Pac-Man and Baby Pac-Man. Namco themselves went on to start using the character when she turned up in Pac-Land and Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures. She became ubiquitous with the franchise, most notably turning up in the Pac-Man World games in the early 2000s, and even getting her own 3D title in the form of Miss Pac-Man Maze Madness, which was released for all the consoles of the time, N64, PlayStation, Dreamcast, and even received a Game Boy Advance port later on, alongside Pac-Man World. This was followed by a PC game, Miss Pac-Man Quest for the Golden Maze. Wherever Pac-Man went, Miss Pac-Man wasn't far behind. She was iconic. Then, in 2010, something happened. Pac-Man Party happened. And aside from ah, and aside from redesigning the classic cast, you know, Pac-Man, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, Clyde, they cut the entire Pac-Man world cast and added a handful of new characters who would go on to never appear again. This exile seemed to extend to every character who didn't make their debut in the original Pac-Man arcade game, meaning, of course, that Miss Pac-Man is noticeably absent. Three years after this exclusion, things started looking even more bleak. is back. Ghost chomping at his feet. Pack's our hero. Pack just can't be beat. Yeah! This could be a video all on its own, but it's very imperative that I talk about it here and now. In 2013, a CGI television series was jointly produced by 41 Entertainment, Arid Productions, and Bandai Namco called Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. The show takes place during Pac-Man's high school days, which of course means that he's not married yet, and thus, Miss Pac-Man is a no-show. I, I mean, I guess he could be married in high school, but I... I don't, I, don't, I don't know if Namco really wanted to take the character in that direction. And actually, this directly contradicts the plot of everybody's favorite DS game, Pac-Girl! In which Miss Pac-Man, referred to in this game as Pac-Girl, meets Pac-Man when they're both pretty young, so we can confirm that this is an entirely new continuity. Bet you didn't think you were gonna learn about Pac-Man lore when you woke up this morning, but here we are. Actually, I'm a little confused about her being referred to as Pac-Girl. My first assumption was, oh, that makes sense. They weren't married yet, so she wouldn't be carrying the Pac-Man surname. But the Miss, as opposed to Mrs, implies that Pac-Man is her maiden name anyways, so maybe it was done to disguise the fact that this character was Miss Pac-Man, or to differentiate her further. We'll open that can of worms back up in a bit. Back to Ghostly Adventures, her absence alone isn't the interesting part. For one thing, Pac-Man has a new group of friends made specifically for this show. One of them, Cylindria, seems to have a thing for Pac-Man, almost acting as a love interest for him. Pinky also has a crush on Pac-Man, meaning that this goddamn Pac-Man show has a love triangle. What a weird, weird thing that exists. Anyways, far more damningly than another circle with legs having a thing for Pac-Man, the show actually goes so far as to confirm that Pac-Man is the only yellow Pac person left, meaning that, in this universe, Miss Pac-Man as we know her can't exist. And that's some shit. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Whatever, Johnny. Just because Bandai Namco did some weird reboot thingy without her doesn't mean anything is up. They just wanted to focus on the original cast. Obviously, fake gamer. And, well, it's true that I am, in fact, a fake gamer. It actually goes a bit deeper than that. Bandai Namco has seemed reluctant to use the character of Miss Pac-Man in anything since around 2007 or 2008. As I've mentioned already, 2005's Pac refers to her as Pac-Girl. Definitely seems to be the same character, though, if the bow is any indication. I'll cut this one a pass, I suppose, partially because of the marital thing, not to mention the fact that during that same year, the very same Miss Pac-Man that we know and love from Pac-Man World 1 and 2 turned up in Pac-Man World 3, with a voice this time. Junior! 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 Junior, you didn't happen to see the... Oh, thanks, Schnooky. Happen to see any sign of the birthday boy? Then, the following year, she appeared as a playable character in Pac-Man World Rally. 
Wonder what game Miss is trying to Mario Kart. And finally, in 2007, she appeared alongside Pac-Man, Blinky, and this Tamagotchi that I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of in Mario Kart Arcade GP2. Wait a second, this one actually is Mario Kart. Holy shit! Miss Pac-Man! an arcade game developed by Bandai Namco. This would prove to be her final appearance for more than a decade, and there is a reason why. Remember how GCC reached an agreement with Namco in 1983, stating that they were to receive royalties if any more Miss Pac-Man arcade machines were ever manufactured? Well... 20 years later. What happens 20 years later? Kevin's taking a drive, and he's on the Mass Pike, and he stops at a rest stop, and he sees this game. 20th anniversary, Ms. Pac-Man. Introduced in 2001 by Namco. And then they did a 25th anniversary later on. And um, Kevin's first thought, of course, is, where's my royalty check? So, so Kevin is like, hey, look, October of 83, we actually had a contract with Namco. At this point, Ms. Pac-Man is done, right? It is done, 1983. No more coin-op, no more trash cans, no more nothing. And um, uh, so we signed a, yeah, 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 if we ever make any more, we'll pay you this much. Dude, you're making them again. So it took a while to negotiate, and we eventually went into demand for arbitration. I mean, they, like, they didn't know. They didn't know we had a contract. It was 20 years later. All those people are long, gone from Namco. We had to fax them the contract. So Bandai Namco ended up being their own undoing, having lost track of the contract over the years, resulting in another lawsuit from GCC in 2002 that was finalized in 2006. 2006, a year before Miss Pac-Man's last major appearance. One can't help but see a correlation there. I'll talk more about the specifics of that lawsuit in a bit, but for now I want to talk about the character herself. She only turned up again as part of a Pac-Man cross-promotion with the mobile game Sonic Dash. Interesting. But there were some other odd goings on in that 10 year gap, particularly during the tail end around 2016. Allow me, if you will, to briefly touch on another topic of interest. In 2015, Bandai Namco announced a program intended for use by Japanese indie and student developers. This program went by several names, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to call it the Namco Creators Program. Details on the exact process are a bit hazy, but from what I can gather, this program allowed independent developers to make iOS, Android, and Flash games based off of various Bandai Namco properties such as Dig Doug, Mappy, and yes, of course, Pac-Man. These developers would not need to approach Bandai Namco about the use of their characters beforehand. However, the game would need to be approved by the company before going live. What if you make like just a perfectly good game, but they just didn't approve it? What then? You just fucking, you put your time in and the, like, wouldn't that be some shit? All I'm saying. In 2017, the platform expanded to include IPs from Data East and Jallico before being discontinued in March of 2018. Personally, I think this was a very clever move on Bandai Namco's part to get a wider reach into the mobile market without actually doing much, at the same time allowing indie developers to get a foot in the door. Though I'm not sure if they actually paid them? The platform and many of the games made for it never left Japan, so maybe if I knew Japanese, I'd make a separate video about this, but regardless, it leads us to an interesting place. In 2016, Mega Run Meets Pac-Man was released for iOS and Android. Details are exceptionally sparse, but clearly from the title, it is effectively a reskin of 2012's Mega Run, one of those 2D auto runner games that everyone likes so much. The reason I bring this game up, however, is actually because Miss Pac-Man is not included as a playable character. But the game does include a female character who looks like Pac-Man and wears a bow, and her name is... Pac-Man Girl. Yes, in a move that would make the executives who named Miss Pac-Man start to blush, this game tries to pretend that nothing is wrong by swapping the iconic Miss Pac-Man for a pale imitation with a weak attempt at a name. Although, to be fair, what else could they have called her? Oh, I don't know. 
Pac Girl, you know, the name that was already given to Miss Pac Man in one instance where they didn't use the more famous moniker. The design is also noticeably different from how she's usually depicted, making Pac Man Girl just legally distinct enough to qualify as a separate entity from Miss Pac Man. Yellow bow instead of red, no lipstick or beauty mark, or eyelashes, or eyebrows. If anything, this only serves to make her look more like Mr. Pac Man, except for the lack of eyebrows, which just looks weird. All the Pac people have been depicted with eyebrows from pretty much as long as the modern incarnations have been a thing, so it just comes off as odd. Anyways, the next damning article of evidence is something incredibly cool that actually ended up being the cataclyst for me wanting to make this video. You'll get why soon enough, but I just want to take a moment to fully appreciate the beauty of the Pac store. Starting in 2016, Bandai Namco began opening a series of pop-up stores based around Pac-Man, called Pac Stores, or Pac-Man Ginza style. These were mostly centered in Japan, aside from one in Hong Kong and another in Hawaii. For the sake of simplicity, I'll be talking mostly about the Japanese Pac stores. These are so cool. After walking into this Pac-Man cafe, you would be greeted by a life-size statue of the man himself. Not only that, but absolutely every piece of the cafe would be decorated with retro Pac-Man iconography. Being a Pac store, there were, of course, a wide variety of Pac-Man products available for purchase, including shirts, fidget spinners, fishing lures, and this lovely, I want to pack you wallet. Classy. From what I can tell, there weren't as many food items as you might expect, although the few they did have were, indeed, Pac-Man themed. I feel like I'm making a Pat Mac video. Wait a minute, if you swap the T and the C in Pat Mac, you end up with, oh my god! But the reason I want to talk about this amazing piece of Pac history is actually largely in part because of what's not there. The marketing for these Pac stores prominently features Pac-Man as well as a female Pac person and a Pac child. Am I leaning too hard into the Pac-Man vernacular? The Pac-Nacular? The Verpacular? This, my boy is a pacloration of independence. Anyways, if you're like me, your immediate assumption based on that statement would be that it's Pac-Man's family, right? Miss Pac-Man and Junior Pac-Man? Well, if you've been paying any attention to the subject matter of this video, you'd probably recognize that this isn't the case. Say hello to Pac-Marie and Pac-Little. Pac-Marie is the strangest oddity of all to me, and a big part of the reason why I decided to make this video. I mean, what a strange decision. If we're assuming that the reason for Miss Pac-Man's absence was indeed the copyright shenanigans with GCC, then Pac-Man Girl makes a good deal of sense. That design is really easy to just buy as Miss Pac-Man. This, though? Not only does she have a more unique name, again, not opting for the obvious Pac-Girl solution, but while the design does at least share the bow with Miss Pack, she seems much more like a distinct character. Even so, the Pack stores contain several arcade machines. Another cool aspect, actually, you can play them as much as you want without paying. But in an interesting twist, Miss Pac-Man machines imported from the United States were actually a common fixture. Clever way to get around having to pay GCC for royalties, I suppose. This also inadvertently led me to the discovery that Miss Pac-Man was never properly released in Japanese arcade cabinet form, which makes sense given the history, but still feels wrong. Similar thing happened with the Junior Pac-Man arcade machines, imported from America even though the character on the wall is technically different. Anyways, the combination of these mysteriously imported Miss Pac-Man arcade machines with all this art of not Miss Pac-Man on the walls surrounding them seems pretty suspect. Almost like they were getting around legal trouble. But then again, there's another possibility that I think is important to consider. What if they chose not to use Miss Pac-Man? as a creative decision. A big part of the reason for the Pac Store's existence was to raise brand awareness and to target new fans. And if you want to reach new fans with an old property, you can't just toss out exactly what worked before and expect it to work every time. Times change. The English version of the website says that part of the aesthetic behind the Pac Store was the idea of giving Pac-Man a kawaii twist. Go Minnesota! And while I think a lot of the Miss Pac-Man artwork from over the years is pretty cute, look at Pac-Marie and Pac-Little. They were clearly designed with this in mind. 
Kawaii means cute in Japanese. If you don't know that, I wasn't wasn't just calling Miss Pac-Man cute oh. unprompted. Don't at me. Actually, let's compare Miss Pac-Man and Pac-Marie a little further since we've started. They're more different than you might expect. Marie isn't a simple reskin. Miss Pac-Man is Pac-Man's wife and Junior Pac-Man's mother. Pac-Marie is just a longtime friend quotation marks of Pac-Man and Pac-Little. But not if this artwork has anything to say about it. Ha! Gotcha. Miss Pac-Man is a character from the 80s who doesn't have many clearly defined personality traits that don't relate to being a wife or a mother. Granted, no Pac-Man character traditionally has a very defined personality, but while Miss Pac-Man seems to be a bit older and very focused on her family, Pac-Marie's bio on the official Pac-Store website says that she's a modern girl, a little overly attached to social media and interested in fashion and singing. Though I can't understand Japanese, these official animated shorts made to promote the Pac-Store seem to support this as well. I think pairing Pac-Man with these other characters, who seem younger and are his friends rather than his family, could be seen as a way to make him seem younger and cooler as well. I mean, you can't really tell his age from looking at him anyway, so he could be however old you want. These are different characters, and honestly, after further research, I'm not sure if Miss Pac-Man was replaced in this instance because of copyright. I mean, they even designed new ghosts, specifically for the pack stores. There's definitely no copyright issue there, especially considering that a lot of the store's merchandise still has the old ones. So what conclusions are we supposed to draw if it's true that Miss Pac-Man wasn't replaced for copyright reasons? in this instance. Well, it would mean that Bandai Namco doesn't think she's cool or marketable, especially for a younger demographic. It's easier to just replace her with an entirely new character than to try redesigning her. And honestly, it's hard to argue. Pac-Marie has a more distinct look than the original Miss Pac-Man, having more differences from this guy than just the addition of a bow. And while it's largely subjective, there's a strong argument that it's a more appealing design. Regardless, neither Pac-Man Girl nor Pac-Marie have made any further appearances in the franchise. Not that they've had much of a chance to, considering that no new Pac-Man game has been anything other than a compilation or variant of the original arcade game since 2014. And since the original lawsuit between Bandai Namco and GCC was finalized in 2006, you can pretty much count the number of Miss Pac-Man re-releases on one hand. And in most cases, they seem to have a way around the contract with GCC. Take Pac-Man's Arcade Party from 2010. This was an arcade cabinet that featured numerous Namco games in the same cabinet. It was released in two variants, one for commercial public use and one for personal home use. And wouldn't you know it, only the home version features Miss Pac-Man, which is conspicuously missing from the commercial version. Why don't we let our old buddy, Steve Golson, tell us why? So let's talk about language. The language in your contract, the language matters. Okay, let me tell you why it matters. What's different about these two machines? You notice? We get paid for one and not for the other. Here's a hint. The one on the left has a coin slot. So we get paid for those. Because the contract says coin-operated game. And the arbitrator said coin-operated game means coin-operated game. And we're like, no, 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 no. That's, back, that's what we called these big arcade things back then. We just generically referred to them as that. He's like, coin-operated means coin-operated. We're like, okay, all right. So we, we don't get any royalties unless it's actually coin-operated. Well, goddamn. <laughs> Because of this, any cabinet that Bandai Namco makes, including Miss Pac-Man, does not require that they pay royalties to GCC if it lacks a coin slot. They even pulled off a similar loophole with a more recent arcade cabinet. Pac-Man's Pixel Bash in 2018. Again, Miss Pac-Man is only included in the home version. The language of this agreement makes me wonder, though. It says, coin-operated game. Does that mean that they can also still re-release Miss Pac-Man in any console compilation title? Well, not exactly. This is where we won big in, in our language. Um, we get paid for electronic distribution. This is Kevin Curran wrote this electronic distribution of the game. Uh, if it's in any other way transmitted to any other receiving device, like say, cell phone, <laughs> um, or your Xbox, right? And so nobody had um, thought about cell phones back then, but this was read very expansively by the arbitrator, so we got it. 
The devil's in the details here. Because of the wording of this part of the agreement, royalties will need to be paid to GCC in the case of Miss Pac-Man being released as part of any console compilation title. It has to be proven that GCC's source code was used, and usually that's done through finding a message they hid in the code reading, Hello Nakamura. Nakamura referring to Masaya Nakamura, the head of Namco at the time of Miss Pac-Man's development. As a result, there has only been one console re-release of Miss Pac-Man since 2006, which would be the digital-only Pac-Man Museum, released for PS3, Xbox 360, and Steam in 2014. And even then, Miss Pac-Man isn't built into the collection. For a month after the game's release, Miss Pac-Man could be added as free DLC, but now, Miss Pac-Man will run you an additional $5 to add to the collection, presumably as part of the royalty agreement. There is a mobile version of Miss Pac-Man, as Steve Golson refers to in that clip I showed you. Buy more for your phone. And, just when I thought that this story had reached its conclusion, while I was scripting this video, something major came up for the first time in years. In September 2019, news came out that Bandai Namco was suing at games over an unauthorized Miss Pac-Man mini arcade cabinet. If you're not familiar, at games is a company known for releasing plug-and-play consoles that feature retro games, often from companies like Atari, Capcom, and Namco. Their products are somewhat infamous for poor quality quality emulation, controllers, and game selections, which often include a bunch of obscure garbage and cheaply made original shovelware games amongst the classics. They're kinda shoddy all around. They used to make these little Genesis plug-and-play consoles before Sega promptly kicked them to the curb and made the Genesis Mini themselves to a far higher amount of press and critical acclaim. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about at games, I don't know what will. Anyways, in this particular case, at games sent a picture of this mini Miss Pac Man arcade cabinet they made to Kevin Curran, one of those original GCC developers who made Miss Pac Man, and he took it as an officially licensed product, even though At Games had not even bothered speaking with Bandai Namco about it beforehand. Bandai Namco caught wind of the cabinet through Curran and were understandably not happy. It didn't help that they'd already had some qualms with At Games, given that they'd been in a partnership and At Games showed the company a plug and play console that used arcade ROMs for approval. When the plug and play eventually hit retail, it ended up using lower quality NES ROMs instead. With all this bad blood, Bandai Namco filed a lawsuit against At Games. It's a big deal. At Games made one Miss Pac Man machine they weren't supposed to make. How does this affect the rights? Well, while At Games was in talks with Kevin Curran and some of the other individuals on that original team, they actually reached a particularly apocalyptic agreement. Remember how GCC has to be paid royalties whenever Miss Pac-Man is used in a coin-operated game or distributed electronically? Well, they don't anymore. They sold their stake in the IP to At Games, meaning that now, instead of paying royalties to the original developers whenever Miss Pac-Man is re-released, Bandai Namco has to pay At Games, a company with a notoriously bad reputation amongst retro game enthusiasts. The most upsetting thing about all of this is that in the lawsuit, Bandai Namco said that they'd been trying to resolve their relationship with GCC, presumably meaning that they'd been trying to buy up that part of the rights and no longer have to pay out royalties. If this was the case, they'd probably have been more willing to resume the use of the character and start re-releasing that original game more often. But now, my guess is that if the ad games thing goes badly, we won't be seeing Miss Pac-Man anytime soon. I'm curious to hear, how did you guys feel about this video? It was a bit of an ambitious project for me, and I really wanted to cover it because I think the history is very interesting, and I didn't see anybody else talking about it in depth. Let me know, and if you enjoyed it, I'll try to do more like this in the future. I'm also obligated by law to start doing the usual YouTube thing where I tell you to like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see more from me. I release a new video like this at the beginning of every month, with some more informal stuff every so often. Anyways, I have been Johnny, and this has been a legal nightmare. Peace!